Acts 11, 19 to verse 30. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord is with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard what what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was, at, it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. They did this, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. Now, have you ever heard, I know if you all heard the old song, Home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play. Some of you guys saw some antelope coming in this morning. Kind of fits for Golden Prairie, doesn't it? Well, there's the other parts to it too, where seldom is heard, a discouraging word, and I won't finish the rest, but... How about that part? Is that true for Golden Prairie Community Church as well? Seldom is heard a discouraging word. If that's true, it hopefully also means where often is heard an encouraging word. Well, today in Acts 11, we see Barnabas encouraging the church in Antioch, and we see the results of it. And uh, I've heard it said that for every discouraging thing or a negative thing even that that is said to us, we need at least five encouraging things or positive things to make up for it. And there's lots that we can learn this morning about what encouragement is and how to do it uh, in the scripture. And like I said, from Barnabas as our main example in our scripture today. So in some ways we're picking up, it almost seems like from chapter 8, even though we're in chapter 11. But in chapter 8, Stephen had just been stoned to death by a mob. uh, And there was a man there by the name of Saul who had started a major persecution for the followers of Jesus. And then all these people who were following Jesus scattered uh, from Jerusalem. And they scattered all over the country. And that was actually good because they were kind of staying in their place there and God wanted them to get out and get the message of Jesus around the country and they started to do that. And then in chapter 9, this Saul who was doing the persecuting, actually Jesus appears to him and he becomes a follower of Jesus. And then in in chapters 10 and 11, the gospel came to the Gentiles, the people who are not Jews, came to them at Caesarea through the apostle Peter. The Jewish believers in Jerusalem had heard about Peter uh, going to the Gentiles, and they first of all criticized him for it. But when he explained what happened and that God was at work, they accepted that the Gentiles were an equal part of the church. So now we're going to see God making the spread of the gospel really pick up steam as believers start bringing the gospel to the Gentile people in other places. And we're going to see some preaching happening here. So we're picking up in verse 19. So it says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to the Jews. Now here's a quick map. It's not the most clear map, but... Uh, Phoenicia is basically, you can see Antioch and Jerusalem on the side. Phoenicia is the area on the coast, kind of in between those two. Uh, Cyprus, of course, is that island right there. So that's where these people kind of scattered initially. And uh, and the, the rest of this chapter, though, is going to focus on Antioch, that Antioch that's north of Jerusalem there. That's where it's located. It's a ways north of Jerusalem. 
And these Jewish believers who had scattered uh, around, they naturally, of course, would speak to their own people. They would speak to other, other Jewish people. But some of them started to preach to the Gentiles in Antioch. Verse 20. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. So these are Jewish believers who did not originally live in Antioch. It says they came from Cyprus and Cyrene. Uh, they lived in, but these are other Greek-speaking areas. And they obviously wanted the Gentiles to hear about Jesus. And the Lord was very much a part of this. And he was working powerfully, as we can see there, bringing the people to faith. And the Lord is bringing about what he had commanded his followers uh, before he ascended back to heaven, that they would be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8 that I've quoted to you how many times already. So word got back, though, about what was happening in Antioch to the people in Jerusalem, to, which is where a lot of the uh, apostles were, that the Gentiles were trusting in Jesus. And so, just like they sent Peter and John to the Samaritans after Philip preached to them, um, they decided to send a trustworthy, a trustworthy leader to see what was happening and also to assist those new believers. So we see Barnabas bringing encouragement in verse 22. It says, When the church at Jerusalem heard what had, what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw this evidence of God's blessing. He was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. So the first question we need to kind of think about, um, you may remember who Barnabas is, but he was introduced to us back in chapter 4. So we need to, to think about who is this guy. So back in chapter 4, we saw him for the first time. It says, for instance, there was Joseph, one of the, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. So Barnabas is actually kind of a Hebrew name, and its translation basically is son of encouragement. And here's a guy who earned a nickname that he really lived up to, son of encouragement. The nickname son of encouragement does not mean that his dad was an encouraging person, but that he himself was characterized by that trait of being an encouraging person. He so lived up to it that in the throat acts, we never see him called Joseph. We always see him called Barnabas, his actual nickname. The second time we saw Barnabas was back in chapter 9. He was acting in an encouraging way to, the, to Saul. Uh, Saul had just become a believer. He came to Jerusalem. He wanted to get together with the believers there, but they wouldn't. They were all afraid of him. So Barnabas became the go-to-between. He basically got Saul, brought him to the other believers, and uh, got him into the fellowship with the people in Jerusalem, helping him to see that when Saul turned to Jesus, that it was real, that it was genuine. So Barnabas earned his nickname uh, very fairly. He was the son of encouragement. So, so this is what kind of we're looking at today. What does it mean to encourage? For myself, I often think of encouraging mainly as being kind of like cheering on somebody like, hey, good job. Or, you know, you did that well. Keep it up. You know, like uh, Ross last week, I said, hey, good job with, with your leading of the service, that type of thing. Um, and that is what it is to some degree. But it's actually quite a bit more than that. Webster's Dictionary says encourage means to inspire or to with courage, spirit or hope. Or to hearten somebody. You could put it all in one word. Uh, it also means to spur on. To stimulate. And that's kind of mainly how I would tend to think of it. But it also means. There's one more there. To attempt to persuade. To urge. And that's strong encouragement. And that's really the Greek word. And the biblical meaning that we have here. The Greek word that's translated there. Encouragement. Uh, means this. From the Greek dictionary. It says to urge strongly. Appeal to, urge, exhort, encourage. So basically really strong encouragement is what it's really thinking about there. So what did Barnabas do to encourage the people in Antioch? Let's go back to that verse, verse 23. 
It says, when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. So he was encouraging them in a very specific way. Barnabas, of course, when he arrived, he was pleased to see the people who had come to genuine faith in Jesus. So to start with, he encouraged them to stay true to the Lord. Not to go back to their old sins or the false worship, whatever they knew before, but to live genuine lives of worship and of devotion to the Lord. And this is a key thing because there are many things in life that come at us that try and divert us from following Jesus. And this is part of the, you know, yeah, keep it up type of encouragement. But it's also that strong urging type of encouragement that wants to help the person to be stronger and to stay true to the Lord. Now, an important thing to notice, though, and this was something in my study that I hadn't really thought about, was the basis. What was the basis of Barnabas's encouragement? It was the Lord. It wasn't his opinion. It wasn't just him trying to cheer people up and urge them on. It was the Lord. We're stay to, to stay true to the Lord Jesus. And when we look at how Jesus was true, he himself was true to the Father and also true to his love for us, that he would endure the cross um, and he would give himself for our sins uh, we are encouraged to do the same thing, to be true to the Lord, because he was also very true to us in his, his mission to, to save us. And many times when we see encouragement like this in the New Testament, it also involves exhortation, which is strong urging, even like pleading with people. It's a little more than you're just doing well. It's the please keep doing well. I want you to do well. Do well for the sake of the Lord. That's what exhortation is, and that's what we're being encouraged, encouraged, told to do as well here. But the basis, again, of that encouragement, of that urging even, is the Lord. It is he who is our king. He is our savior. He is our creator. And we are encouraged uh, because of what he's done in saving us through his grace, through his love, and his goodness. For example... In First Thessalonians, here is some, some encouragement. It says, we pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives in, in a way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. He's saying there, he's, there, he's pleading, he's encouraging, he's urging. But it's based on what God considers a worthy way for us to live. So again, it's not our opinion that we bring to others, but it's the truth that God would have us to live by because we are called by God to take part in his kingdom. Even when we're helping people with personal issues, we should appeal to them because we all belong to the Lord. For example, from Philippians 4.2, Paul is writing here. He says, now I appeal to a Yodia and Syntyche Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. It's like saying, well, we all belong to the same family. So let's learn how to settle disagreements and work together for the glory of God's kingdom. But if you notice his wording, he says, I, I appeal to you. He's so strongly urging, he's almost even begging these two ladies. And it's important for each of us as followers of Jesus and as part here of Golden Prairie Community Church to really think about how we encourage each other and that we do it willingly and joyfully to help each other look to the Lord and to his goodness and his grace for our for strength and comfort in both the good things that happen and in the hard uh, things of life. And this is teaching us to go a little deeper than just just good job, to really care enough about others to talk about tough stuff and plead with them even if we have to as necessary. Here's another example from Acts 13 of Paul and Barnabas doing just this. Acts 13, 43. It says, Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. Now, this is a good example of urging, of this strong encouragement. And it says there particularly to continue to rely on the grace of God. 
Because you see, we don't, we don't rely on God's grace just to receive our initial forgiveness of sins, our salvation. We do rely on his grace for that. But we also need God's grace all the time, every day. And so he says, continue to rely on the grace of God. I heard a great uh, illustration of this, and I'll get to it in a second. But when we first hear the gospel and we understand that God's holy and that we aren't, and we hear the good news that Jesus died for our sins in our place. And if we turn from our sin and put our trust in Jesus and give him our lives to follow him, then God forgives us our sins and makes us his people. That's the gospel. Now, we could, could, we could compare the gospel to being like a diving board, which we jump off of into the pool of God's forgiveness and grace. And the gospel gets us in. It's just like this diving board. But the truth of the gospel is that it's also the pool that we live in from then on. We must live in the truth of God's forgiveness and right standing before God every moment of every day. The gospel doesn't just get us into it. We stay in there. We live in it. The truth of the gospel is that pool that we live in from then on. We, we, because we so often fumble, we so often fail as we try to live as God would have us to. But as we continue to rely on the grace of God, the Holy Spirit continues to change us, to make us more like Jesus every day. And this is something we can encourage and even urge each other in all of the time. You see, encouraging each other is really one of our main purposes as we meet together. Hebrews 10, 25, it says, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but... Do what? Encourage one another, especially now uh, that the day of his return is drawing near. We certainly can't encourage each other if we don't see each other. And as the days grow closer to when Jesus returns, following Jesus is going to be harder and harder, as he told us that it would, that that would happen. And it's vital that we help each other along. See, encouragement gives us strength to continue when things get hard. Again, another example from Acts 14. It says, After preaching the good news in Derbe and making disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia, where they strengthened the believers. They encouraged them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The idea that if you follow Jesus, things will be easy is not something that's found in the Bible at all. The exact opposite, of course, is stated again and again. And here's just one example of that. It takes continual trust in God to go through the hardships that God promised that we would be facing. And it's at these times that we need each other to help and encourage us to continue in the faith, to continue trusting that God has everything in control even when we don't understand what's going on. So what are some ways that we can encourage each other? It's very helpful and encouraging to remind each other of the things that God promises us. Romans 15, 4 and 5. It says, Such things were written in the Scriptures long ago to teach us. And the Scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. And as that says, true encouragement comes through God and his word. And God uses people. He uses each other to bring this truth to bear in each other's lives as we remind and encourage each other of who God is and what he's done. This means we need to know God's word, obviously, and what he promises so that we can share these things with people who need to hear them. We can also be encouraging to each other to to share Jesus with others around us. This is something else we can encourage each other in. Galatians 2.9 says, In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God has, how God had given me. And this is Paul who is speaking, who is writing this. And they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. 
So James, Peter, and John were saying, you know, we have this ministry to the Jewish people, and you, Paul, and Barnabas have this great ministry to the Gentiles. Keep doing it. Be encouraged to keep doing that. And really for us, it's the same thing. God has placed each one of us in our particular families, in our life situations, and we have relationships with people that we have opportunity to share Jesus with that others don't. We have unique situations like that. So I would encourage you to be encouraging each other, to continue to do that, to be praying for each other, to reach out for those around, around you that you are uniquely situated to share the gospel with. And a great way to encourage each other in this way as far as sharing our faith is to share your stories of, of the witnessing opportunities God has given you when you have them. And then we can also pray for you and pray for the people that you shared with. Now, all this encouraging to be encouraging. Oh, sorry. All this encouragement to be encouraging. um, In this, I want to give you an example of encouragement in action and the great ways that God can use you. I want to return to Barnabas, Mr. Son of Encouragement, and see how God used him hugely to help Saul, firstly, and a guy by the name of John Mark. I want this encouragement to be our encouragement, to be encouraging those around us. You think I could string along any more encouraging uh, words there? Well, in our section today, after Barnabas encourages the people of Antioch to be true to the Lord, he then goes to look for Saul, knowing that the city of Antioch would be the perfect place for Saul Because he would be just the right kind of guy to really help these Gentile people to be established in the truth about Jesus. See, we left Saul. He ended up, after he got got saved, after he uh, became a believer, he ended up going to Jerusalem. He caused so much trouble there that they said, you better get out of here. You're causing too much problems. They sent him off and he went back to Tarsus where he grew up. And he's still there. So we find in uh, verse 25... Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. So again, we don't really know what Tar- Saul was doing in Tarsus. That's just where he, he ended up going after the, to get the heat off of everybody else. But Antioch was the perfect place for him with his knowledge of Scripture with his knowledge of Greek language and Greek culture. Um, And between him and Barnabas, uh, they they established um, a great ministry there. Both of them had great ministry where they were helping out the the Gentile believers in that place. And you'll notice as well that this is the first place where believers got the name Christians. This was the word, the, the name originated. The name basically means one who is associated with Christ. That's what the name means. This is where the term originated in that place. So Antioch, as a result of the work of Barnabas and Saul, it became a really important Gentile church with many leaders. We'll see it appearing again in the book of Acts as we go along. So after this year, then the Holy Spirit calls Barnabas and Saul to head out and spread the gospel in other places. And we're going to skip to uh, chapter 13 of Acts, verse 2. It says, one day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. Now, at this point, in the very next verse, we're going to be introduced to a guy by the name of John Mark. So this isn't the first time he appears in Scripture. He actually, we see him first in chapter 12 of Acts. But in our case, this is the first place we're kind of seeing him. So the next verse, um, verse 5, says, There in the town of Salamis, they went to a Jewish synagogue and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Now, John Mark... This guy is actually a cousin of Barnabas. But something happens. A glitch happens, and John Mark actually leaves them suddenly partway through the mission. And we find this in verse 13 of of Acts 13. 
It says, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now we aren't told why he left them. We're just told that he left and he went home. He kind of quit halfway through and Paul is really not impressed. After completing the missionary journey they were on, they went all through the north and Europe and different places, Paul and Barnabas came back to Antioch, stayed there for a while, and then they got set to go on another missionary journey. At this point, Barnabas wants to take John Mark with him again, but Paul does not want to do that. We're going to Acts 15, verse 36. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and as as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. So Paul felt so strongly, very strongly, of course, that it was not wise to take somebody who had previously deserted them. Again, we don't know exactly why he left. Uh, John Mark did, but it doesn't look like it was a healthy kind of thing. Paul used a strong term of deserted, and he evidently doesn't want to take a chance on a guy who left them in the middle of what they were doing. And Paul wouldn't back down in his view. He wanted helpers he could rely on and trust in. Barnabas evidently wanted to give John Mark a second chance. He wanted to help and encourage him to be the man that God wanted him to be. And if you think about it, that's just who Barnabas was. They didn't call him the son of encouragement for nothing. So Paul and Barnabas went their separate ways. Barnabas went back to Cyprus and he took John Mark. Paul went north with another partner. And we don't hear again from Barnabas or John Mark again in the book of Acts. So what happened to them? Well, we actually know. We actually hear about John Mark in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Only now he's actually just being called Mark. Listen to what Paul wrote about Mark in 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Bring a Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Wow. Paul went from, I'm not having this guy with me, to he's helpful to me in ministry. What happened? Barnabas happened. He went with Barnabas. The son of encouragement is what happened. Barnabas believed in Mark enough to take him with him, and obviously Mark had changed, and probably changed very dramatically. Paul could see it, and now he wants Mark's help. In fact, when we get looking, there's some some other places. Mark had actually been with Paul for a while already before uh, Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was actually the very last book that Paul wrote. He wrote it very shortly before he was actually executed by Nero. There were some books that he wrote before that, and he mentions Mark in those books as well. Paul wrote letters, um, Colossians Colossians, 4.10. It says, Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings, and so does Mark, Barnabas' cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. He's also mentioned in the book of Philemon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, send you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. So he's calling Mark a co-worker along with Luke. Somehow Mark was a co-worker with the Apostle Paul over a number of years. And as we read in Timothy, Paul regarded him as helpful in ministry. Mark had evidently spent a bunch of time also with the Apostle Peter. Peter even mentions him in 1 Peter 5.13. He says there, Your sister church here in Babylon sent you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now before these times, you've heard the name Mark before. Where? There is a gospel by the name of Mark. 
an account written of the life of Jesus, written by a person named Mark. Guess who that is? It's this same guy. John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. He wrote down what Peter told him of the life of Jesus. So Mark went from being a ministry quitter to living a life of useful ministry, even writing one of the biographies of Jesus. We have no idea what would happen to him had not the son of encouragement invested in him. No wonder Barnabas is held up as an example to us. The encouragement is so important among God's people, among ourselves here. It helps us to be what God wants us to be in a way that God designed his church to function. This is what, one of the things that God wants us to do for each other. Each person who follows Jesus can be helping each other. And much of the time, it can be through encouragement, through urging and exhortation, as we've been talking about. So what do you think Barnabas did to help Mark so dramatically? If you think of what Mark was like, was he afraid? Was he feeling inadequate? Was he immature? Was Was he discouraged? I'm pretty sure Barnabas encouraged Mark to stay true to the Lord, to don't go back to the the old sins, don't go back to the comfortable lifestyle, don't quit. I'm sure Mark, um, sorry, Barnabas encouraged Mark to live worthy of the Lord. You may not, not have done everything right so far, Mark, but ask God's forgiveness. Stand up, keep living for him. Barnabas probably encouraged Mark to continue in the grace of God. When you fail, Go to Jesus for forgiveness and strength to continue. Don't let failure stop you. God's grace never quits. Continue in God's grace. Barnabas would have probably encouraged Mark with, Be strong in the Lord when there is hardship. The Holy Spirit gives us strength, Mark, hope and patience in tough times and situations. Know that this is part of the Christian life. And these are all things, of course, that we can encourage each other as well through the tough times and in all these situations. Barnabas would have encouraged Mark with, keep preaching. There are many people out there who have not heard about Jesus and need to be told. I can see Barnabas encouraging and urging Mark in all of those ways. And we have been encouraged as we have looked at those things too, I hope. And this is one of our main, remember, this is one of our main purposes for meeting together, is to encourage each other in these kinds of ways. So how have people been an encouragement to you when you follow, and your following of Jesus? I'm sure you've had some. But how can you also be an encouragement to others as we follow Jesus? Well, I strongly encourage you to do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this encouragement to be encouraging. And I won't string together any more encouragings, but thank you that you put us together as a people, as a group, so that we can help each other in lots of ways, whether just by a, a good job or by really strong urging and encouraging in that way. Father, help us to do that for each other. Help us to see and to love each other and to, uh, to just come beside each other as we can. Thank you that you do that for us, yourself, through your word and uh, by your spirit. Thank you that you encourage us because we do fall, we do fail so often. Thank you for all that you give. Just again, help us to uh, just apply this in whatever way you have been speaking to us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.